right, we'll start with this. Well, Kazakhstan's own Feruza Sharapova is set to be returning to action September 12th against an opponent that, I don't know. I looked her up. Ran a search on Lyubov Belyakova, and the search yielded no results. I mean, I don't know what kind of opponent this is. I can only deduce that... It's likely a pedestrian-level opponent. Card is set to go down in Feruza Sharapova's native Kazakhstan. She's going to be making an appearance there, and... It feels like an impromptu appearance. Feels spur of the moment. Does feel 13th hour. Feruza was in action earlier this year in April, and she fought two times last year. Off and on, there was a lot of talk about a Sofia Ochigava rematch. Sofia Ochigava, who gave Feruza Sharapova her first and only professional loss. Those talks picked up, and then they fizzled out. Happened more than once. We talked about it here on the channel. I don't know where we are with that. I don't know if the Sharapova people haven't abandoned that idea completely. Abandoned that idea entirely. She's supposed to be fighting this Belyakova girl in a few days. You know, I've said this before that Feruza Sharapova sometimes feels like a, a, a wasted talent almost. The way she's been competing on the outskirts of the lightweight and super featherweight divisions, the fringe of it all. These are deep divisions. Deep weight classes where there are any number of notoriable fighters to go around, all around the world. And Feruza Sharapova hasn't faced... With the exception of Ochigava in her debut. Solid fighter. I mean, the last really solid fighter that Feruza Sharapova has locked horns with in recent memory. You didn't want to call it that. Was Russia's own Yulia Kutsenko way back when in 2018. Yulia was an unbeaten fighter at the time, I have to say. Yulia's better than the girls that Farouz has been fighting. Has fought in her last three fights. No idea how much better she might be than this Belyakova girl. Can't seem to find her. But mostly pedestrian level opponents. And it is good that Feruza Sharapova was able to fight two times, at least two times last year, get two fights in, in spite of the global pandemic. It's good that she's actually fought at least once this year, that she's not wasting away collecting dust on the shelf. It is good that they're keeping her active, but you just get the sense that she's not reached her full potential. She could be doing better. She is a skilled boxer. She's not a pretty face. Not just. And she really hasn't had the chance yet. I mean, she's not just a pretty face. This girl can box. She's got skills. But she's not putting them on display against the kind of quality opponents that would really get her career some attention. Yeah, she's a bit of a debutante. Bit of a personality over there in her native Kazakhstan. Public figure having appeared on several reality TV shows. And you know what? Maybe that's just what she is. I mean, at this point, yeah. I don't see anything resembling an earnest effort to become a, a full-fledged world champion and, and consolidate world titles the way... You know, we're seeing in the 140 pound division what we saw with Katie Taylor at 135 pounds, at 130 pounds. You got all those champions. They're all on a collision course. I don't see or feel that energy when it comes to Feruza. And maybe it's because, well, there is no earnest effort. Maybe that's not what they're shooting for. It might have looked that way a couple of years ago. There were some rumblings of a potential Eva Wallstrom fight back when Eva Wallstrom of Finland, the then reigning WBC Super Featherweight Champion, was still champion. There were some rumblings, some rumors of a fight between them. That didn't materialize the same way that the Ochigava rematch. That didn't materialize either. Several cancellations. It just reads like a career that's in haphazard condition, lacking a sense of direction, a real sense of direction, and... She's supposed to be fighting on the 12th, though. I doubt any broadcasters in this part of the world picked up this card, which is set to go down on the 12th over there in Kazakhstan, and I don't know, we'll just, we'll see where it goes. If it goes anywhere. Later on this month, on the 18th, France's own unbeaten Alem Mechaled is supposed to be returning to action. This will be Alem's first fight since December of 2019. That's right. It's coming up on close to two years of inactivity. Just a few months short of two years. LM Mechaled campaigns in the 130-pound division, the super featherweight division, one of the deepest divisions in women's boxing, one of the hottest divisions in women's boxing. LM Mechaled is a quality operator. She's going to be fighting Paza Malajic. Paza, who was very recently in action earlier this year against unbeaten Rima Ayadi, also of France. She's supposed to be fighting LM on the 18th. In some ways, it's an important fight. 
for Elam Khaled in some ways it's a fight of some significance because this will allow her to swing back into action and salvage what remains of 2021 get a fight in there so that once 2022 rolls around you can move on to something bigger Elam is a quality operator though most people don't know that because most people haven't seen her she's been out of action a while but she sports professional record 14 wins no losses with two knockouts you know she's a quality operator but she hasn't had the chance to really make a splash yet. So hopefully what this heralds is, is the beginning of Elem Mechaled really getting into the mix of the super featherweight division that has no shortage of talent, no shortage of challengers, no shortage of champions. Let's hope that Elem Mechaled beyond this September 18th fight is a more busy fighter, a more active fighter, because I'd like to see her in the ring with some of these other guiles. In other news, some images that have gotten a lot of people's attention ahead of what is supposed to be the Canelo Alvarez versus Caleb Plant undisputed super middleweight title fight. It appears that Caleb Plant has enlisted the aid of both Andre Ward and his former trainer, Virgil Huntor, Andre Ward, former unified and light heavyweight champion. Oh, so Ward's helping this guy. To what extent? I don't know. I don't know the significance of Andre Ward or Virgil Hunter in Caleb Plant's corner ahead of what's supposed to be this upcoming Canelo Alvarez fight. I don't know the extent, the full extent of what their role is, if they even have a role, though. Looking at these images... What are you guys trying to do, tag team him? Who got in contact with who? Who reached out to who? Did Caleb Plant come to you or did you go to him? Because it looks like what it looks like. Listen, in preparation for a match, especially a big one, you are going to enlist the aid of sparring partners, and some of them might be very familiar faces. Yeah. Usually they're active fighters, though. Not inactive ones. Not retirees. And I don't want to overstate the role of Andre Ward in Caleb Plant's preparation, since, you know, in these images, he's not wearing headgear. He's not sparring, Caleb. I don't want to jump to conclusions. It looks a lot like he's just giving him some tips, giving him some pointers, and maybe that's the extent of it. Just a little bit of advice. These images... They've led to a lot of talk about a fantasy fight, a mythical matchup between today's Canelo Alvarez, the campaigns in the super metal weight division. And yesterday's Andre Ward. Andre Ward, who won the Super 6 tournament. Andre Ward, who sometime after that moved up to the light heavyweight division, retired there after having fought Sergey Kovalev, that division's unified champion at that time, two times up. You know, most of Andre Ward's work, his body of work, the bulk of it, really was at 168 pounds. He only actually had three, maybe four fights as a light heavyweight. You know, the Paul Smith fight, the Sullivan Barrera fight, and the two Sergey Kovalev fights. Most of what he did, he did as a super middleweight. Now stated, these images have led to a lot of conversations about what would happen, what could happen in a time machine between today's Canelo Alvarez and yesterday's Andre Ward. Andre Ward that won the Super 6 tournament. And, you know, I hear this stuff and, and you just get the sense that a lot of these people that are bringing up this mythical matchup are doing so in order to shade Canelo Alvarez, in order to slight him. They don't actually like Caleb Plant's chances against Canelo Alvarez. They want to say that today's super middleweight division is a weaker division than really? the division that Andre Ward was campaigning in all those years ago at that time. And I resist such people. I do. I resist these people that want to say that Canelo Alvarez is taking a tour of Euro bums. Quips about Callum Smith. And quips about Billy Joe Saunders. Quips about the legitimacy of Canelo Alvarez's title run, his undisputed run at 168 pounds. I mean, I hear this stuff and it sounds a lot to me like what they're trying to do is preemptively downgrade Canelo Alvarez's status as an undisputed champion should he become an undisputed champion. With the name of Andre Ward. They are using the career of Andre Ward to shade Canelo Alvarez. That's what I see. That's how it feels. I'll tell you this much. I've always thought that Andre Ward was a quality operator. I've always thought that he was, when he was active, one of the very best and brightest fighters in the entire sport of boxing, one of the best boxers in the world, no doubt about it. But here today in, in 2021, it's safe to say that Canelo Alvarez has a better resume now than Andre Ward had then. Head and shoulders, what are we talking about? Just give it to you straight. It's the only way I know how to give it to you. It's not a knock on Ward, but Canelo Alvarez has a far more robust body of work. Canelo Alvarez here today is a full-fledged four-division champion, whereas Andre Ward retired 
a two division champion. Uh, Canelo Alvarez comparatively has faced more active reigning world champions than Andre Ward did. You know, when he was an active fighter, Canelo Alvarez is still adding to his legacy. He's very close to becoming an undisputed champion. Just one fight away. The most alphabet titles that Andre Ward ever held at a time were about three. You know, Andre Ward, he came close to becoming an undisputed champion himself. Close, but no cigar. Canelo Alvarez in the very near future, he could see himself become that. Something that Andre Ward never became. Something that he didn't do. You know, when he beat Sergei Kovalev, there was only one other active reigning world champion left in the light heavyweight division, Adonis Stevenson. But Ward, he didn't fight him. He retired. And maybe it was due to the politics. Your promoter versus my promoter, your platform versus mine, all that jazz. Maybe it was. But Canelo Alvarez himself, himself, has created an environment to where he is not subject to political boundary lines. He's doing what needs to be done to have that fight, to make that history that cannot be counted against him. Essentially, what I'm getting at is that... Canelo has a better resume than Andre Ward. There's no shame in that. But Canelo Alvarez's body of work is more extensive and more robust than Andre Ward's is. Now, both of these guys... They're great fighters. ...and aren't strangers to controversy. Some would accuse Andre Ward of being given a gift decision in the first Sergei Kovalev fight, the same way that some would accuse Canelo Alvarez of being gifted a draw, which should have been a loss, in the first Gennady Golovkin fight. So let's not fucking split hairs. Canelo Alvarez over more professional fights throughout more divisions against more active reigning world champions. Canelo has a better resume than Andre Ward. It is a statistical matter of fact. Some fucking fantasy fight ain't gonna change that. But if a fucking fantasy fight is what you have to resort to in order to shade this guy. I mean, if that's all you got, then you ain't got much. That's for the fanboys. Comes to Andre Ward himself, and whatever role he is or isn't playing in Caleb Plant's corner, you look at these images and they evoke certain emotions, certain sentiments. I mean, you are helping this guy to some degree. You're not providing advice and pointers to both the combatants. You can't necessarily claim to be Switzerland. I don't know who reached out to who. I just know how it looks. And depending on how all of that happened and how all of that broke down, well, one could interpret that as Andre Ward himself shading Canelo Alvarez. Why are you helping this guy? Because regardless of who reached out to who, if that's what you're doing, if you're helping him, then you are on his side. That side. And not on Canelo's. Any way you slice it. You have picked a side. If you're helping this guy. If you've got an active role in this guy's corner, you're going to be helping him prepare for the fight with Canelo Alvarez. Well, you're not neutral. You ain't Switzerland. So what are you guys trying to do? Tag team him? What, he's too much for Caleb by himself? You're doing the strength and numbers thing? Is that what you're doing? Because that's how it looks. That's how it reads. It can be interpreted as a form of weakness if it was Caleb Plant that reached out to Andre Ward. If the shoe's on the other foot, it was Ward that reached out to Caleb. Well, that can be interpreted as a form of shade, a form of jealousy. I mean, why do you care who wins this fight? Why are you providing this guy advice? What difference does it make to you? You'd rather that Caleb win the fight? Why? And finally, Golden Boy Promotions, by way of their Twitter account, posted this image seen here, hinting at a potential Ryan Garcia versus Joseph Diaz fight. Yeah! Likely set to go down either this fall before the year is out or early next year. Ryan Garcia returns. And it essentially means... You know what it means. Neither one of these guys is going to be fighting Devin Haney, which is what I told you. Devin Haney himself caught wind of the tweet and reacted to it by saying, Duck. Put simply, ducks. Doesn't sound like a broken record. But Garcia versus Diaz, it's not a bad fight. It's a good little interesting situation in and of itself it is but looking at it you have to ask yourself how bad did joseph diaz really want that devin haney fight because joseph diaz is the wbc's interim champion and if you want to get devin haney in the ring you have the avenue of opportunity to do that you can pressure the wbc to order the fight mandate it set a deadline and if a deal isn't reached by that deadline it goes to a purse bid i mean if you don't like the kind of money that the haney people are offering you you don't have to take it let the fight go to a purse bid and let the fight go to the highest bidder that's if you want the fight if you really want the fight but if you don't really want the fight you fight Ryan Garcia instead, your stablemate. In defense of an interim title. As opposed to a full one. There's a lot of discussions, a lot of debates as to whether or not Teofimo Lopez actually is that division's undisputed champion. And the answer to that question is fairly simple. If Teofimo Lopez 
were to leave the lightweight division here today. Who'd be the WBC champion? Devin Haney. Why? Because Teofimo Lopez ain't got the WBC world title. He's a franchise champion. If he leaves the division, he takes that with him. It's not complicated, and it never was. He couldn't have beaten Vasil Lomachenko for a title that Vasil Lomachenko didn't have. By the time he fought him, Vasil Lomachenko already relinquished that title. Devin Haney opted for franchise status instead. That's what he won from Loma. The hundredth fucking time. Neither Ryan Garcia or Jojo Diaz seem all that interested in fighting Devin Haney for his version of the WBC title, even though it's his version of the title that would make either of them world champions. Full-fledged world champions. Take a head count. It's looking like Ryan Garcia is going to fight Jojo Diaz. We know Teofimo Lopez very soon is going to be fighting George Kambosos. Vasil Lomachenko is supposed to be fighting Richard Comey before this year is out. And Rolly Romero, he's already hinting at a Javante Davis fight. So where does that leave Devin? I've been saying it the whole time. It's about time that Devin Haney abandon ship in the lightweight division and beat those guys to the punch. Get up there to 140 and position yourself for a world title shot so that if and when Josh Taylor moves up... You can fight for one of his old belts. He's wasting his time at lightweight. Those guys down there, for whatever reason, they're not going to fight him. they rather fight each other. They say whatever they want to say on fucking Twitter. They all do, but it doesn't result in fights. Actual fights with the guy they're talking about. Rolly Romero's got no shortage. Nice things to say about Devin Haney. I have a does Jojo Diaz, but does any of that materialize? Does any of that actually result in a fight? Is it going to? It doesn't look like it. And you know that a good number of these guys are going to end up moving up in weight. You know that a good number of these guys are going to end up moving up to 140 pounds. So why don't you beat them to the punch? Get up there before they do. Right now, they're freezing you out. That's what they're doing. They're having whole slumber parties you're not invited to. You're going to stick around? I honestly think the next logical step for Devin Haney is to get a head start. 140 pounds.